Hi, I'm Patricia Greenberg. And today I'm delighted to have with us Janice Jabreen. She's a freelance health writer and registered dietitian, a wellness program developer and adjunct professor at Georgetown University. She also has a degree in foreign service, which we're gonna to touch upon later because I'm fascinated with that. Welcome Janice. I'm so happy to be here, thank you. You know, I came across your article in National Geographic titled, Ultra Processed Food Isn't Just Bad for Your Health, It Messes With Your Mind. Um, and obviously it caught, my, it caught my eye. Consuming ultra processed foods that are typically high in salt, sugar, and fat, cheap and accessible may boost the risk of anxiety, depression, and cognitive decline. So needless to say, I've been screaming about this for years. Tell us really about like, where do we start with this? Well, I think we should start with what is an ultra processed food yes. because for these researchers to have found this association between high intake of ultra processed food and mental issues, they have to define it. And different researchers have different ways. This one system seems to be prevailing when you go to the research. It's called the NOVA system developed in, in Brazil. So I have some props. <laughs> so here we go with this pear. That is obviously completely unprocessed. And um, something like, I don't know if you can see the walnuts. Now they don't show up. Um, they're also unprocessed. You had to crack the shell. But um, so there's you know milk, yogurt, flour, unprocessed. Then we get into processed ingredients. You know, how do you get olive oil? Well, it's, you know, you have to press the olives. So that's slightly processed. Um, and then there's this big category called processed. And I think this is so important because I don't want people feeling guilty about eating and my mother prop here yeah. and salmon. Right. You look at the mm -hmm. ingredient list, right? It's salmon and salt. That's it. Um, we can beans, super healthy. So bread, um, you know, there's just so many things in, in this category. The problem gets into this ultra processed. And these, I think you kind of know it when you see it. Um, you pick up a package and I found like the Nutrigrain strawberry breakfast bars. They have 48 ingredients. Wow. Um, some of those are vitamins and minerals, but then you think, why did they need to add them in? <laughs> because the other ingredients don't have any nutrition. And so it's these long, you know, additives, artificial sweeteners, artificial colorings, even the natural flavors aren't very natural. So all of these things, maybe some of them are fine, but some of them are doing bad things to us. And then we can talk about the whys, you know, why they're bad for us as well. You know, I want to ask you about that with, with granola bars and there's the fast, there's, and we'll just, I'm sure we could break this down even further. There's like you say, yes, olive oil is processed. Um, baking bread, it's, there's a processing involved. You, you know, you could eat everything raw, but you know, it takes away all the pleasure in life and you're still getting healthy benefits. Like you say, canned beans, I've had people tell me that, you know, they won't buy cut up vegetables from the supermarket because it's, you know, been handled or pro I mean, it gets a little bit ridiculous. Um, but when we talk about, we walk down the perfect example is the cereals and the chip aisle, right? So you walk down the cereal aisle and there's the bags of granola claiming they're all natural. There's the, you know, the healthy granola bars. There's the processed granola bars. There's the nut bars, you know, at what point, uh, do you feel or do you recommend there's is there there is a, a limit as well you know for those of us who are very athletic might want to keep energy bars health bars granola bars whatever term you want to give it in our glove compartment so after we go you know for a workout we get back in the car there's something easy to eat like even within that category you know what is the limitation should you is it okay to have it once in a while is is it based on quantity or just the sheer eating something ultra processed is harmful okay well let's use i think that's a perfect example are the granola and energy bars so you turn that label around it's always about looking at the ingredient list forget what they say <laughs> at the front of the package because there's a lot of claims that the fda still allows 
like natural, you know, well, you know, doesn't mean much. So turn the energy bar around. If you're seeing a long list of ingredients, a lot of them, you have no idea what they are. I would look for another one. If you are seeing oats and nuts, it's been like a kind bar. You know, that is barely processed. But some of these others built based on isolated soy protein and all these emulsifiers and things. You know, for a person who is athletic, and if the rest of the diet's pretty good, even if the energy bar, energy bar is super ultra processed, nothing's gonna happen to you. If like most Americans, 57% of your calories are coming from ultra processed food, by the way, that's 67% for children, Yeah means then the problem begins you know and so i want to talk about your findings um you know that consuming the ultra processed foods that are you know, what, what we really what we think about is the salt and the sugar and the fat you know they're cheap and accessible um tell me how this boosts the risks of anxiety depression and cognitive decline what's the relationship okay well so you know Researchers go out, some of these studies are involving 11,000 people, another study, half a million people. And some of the studies, they look at people at just one point in time, and that's cross-sectional, they call it. So they see people fill out a food record, eating a lot of ultra-processed foods, they're more depressed, more anxious, have a greater cognitive decline for their age. Other studies have been tracking people for five years, 10 years, and seeing the more ultra processed foods they eat, the faster their rate of cognitive decline, the more anxiety. It, maybe they started out the study with no anxiety, no depression. Those who are eating more of these ultra processed foods at the end of the study have 50% more. Um, one study, they have, you know, people had double the risk of getting something called vascular dementia. Um, which is really like mini strokes to the brain. So, um, th so your question is, you know, what my findings were that, you know, definitely there's this link. Now, why that occurs, um, I can tell you about that if you have a minute. Yes, 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 please. Okay. Yeah. okay, so what you just said, fat, um, sugar, salt, these things, you know, in general, are connected to higher risk of heart disease and cancer and type two diabetes. So how do they affect your brain? One of the ways is inflammation. And that's the big buzzword now. It's the root cause, not the only root cause, but a root cause of a lot of chronic diseases. And so when your brain, it's not just that, you know, other organs get inflamed, the brain can get inflamed. And that causes a lot of problems. And so how do these foods What's that link between eating these foods and an inflamed brain? One of them is those microbes, your, the gut microbiome. What you eat is really reflected in those mi microbes. So if you're eating this great Mediterranean diet with fruits and vegetables and lots of fiber, those um, microbes that love fiber are going to blossom. And you're going to get more of those. And they produce anti-inflammatory compounds you're eating a lot of saturated fat and you're going to get more microbes that digest saturated fat in the walls of their little cells they produce inflammatory compounds those hit your gut increase the risk of colon cancer and they travel up throughout the body as well and then um, one of the researchers i interviewed for this national geographic story she's um, in australia and she was saying that these additives, the artificial sugars, emulsifiers, preservatives, colorings, some of these now, they're seeing that they go up to the brain and they actually interfere with your brain chemistry, with the um, serotonin and dopamine and things like that and affect your mood. So you've got inflammation, you've got you know direct effects on, on mood. Um, and so these are just some of the ways, you know, and just when people, one more thing is the sugar itself tr coursing through, it really starts to damage the um, lining of the arteries and the blood vessels. So that's where heart disease comes in. And that's where these mini strokes, cog cognitive decline 
comes into play. This is so critical now for what what we know about the unfortunate onslaught of diabetes. It's it's an epidemic proportion. Um, diabetes has a, a, a diabetes means. Let's inform everybody because I say this over and over. Um, is that diabetes means technically that you have too much sugar in the blood, or to, that's exactly what it means is sweet. And and, exactly. and what happens is the sugar that gets uh, that's hanging around in your bloodstream that's not being um, uh, neutralized by the insulin causes damage to the arteries and the heart and the brain and the kidneys. So what people do is that they don't address it, they don't address it, and then later in life there's cognitive decline, there's kidney disease, etc. And so this is something that you know we are screaming at young people to try to get a handle on is that they don't end up with this because the pre-diabetes, what people are seeing when, when your blood sugar is hovering at a higher rate for years and years and years, this long-term damage. You know, Janice, this leads me to, this is like a several part question, but so we know there's a direct co correlation between what we eat and you're, you're describing that beautifully with the inflammatory response. Um, anxiety, depression, also plays a role. If you just don't feel well, you're going to find yourself more anxious and depressed, both, you know, has a, has a, a, an emotional toll as well as a physical. Now, is this cumulative in your life? I mean, you're saying it's showing up in younger people more and more. So if it, you know, did, where it gets just, just gets chalked up to later in life saying, well, it's your age or you're, you're declining because of your age and, um, not so much you didn't take care of yourself when you were, but you know, over 50, you know, this happens and we're seeing this in younger people. So my question to you is kind of twofold. Yes, we can prevent a lot of it by changing it, but if you're in a state of distress where you're experiencing cognitive decline, you're experiencing heart and brain problems due to a diet solely or predominantly on ultra high processed foods, can we reverse this by changing your diet to a more, uh, you were, use Mediterranean fruits, vegetables, fiber, um, so forth, and getting the, the high sugar and ultra processed. Is it reversible, I guess, is, is my question in, the, in short. You know, I have asked this question to researchers and every, all of them say it's never too late. Now, huh. It can't be, if you've had some strokes, mini strokes, things like that, if your arteries are very clogged, there are some extremely dramatic Dean Ornish diets where you yes. really, <laughs> you can't eat anything and you have to <laughs> meditate, you have to do all this. Yeah. And he's shown that you can actually start to unclog arteries. Um, but, you know, A, you can stop, you can halt further problems. And there is some evidence, especially if you put exercise in the mix here, that you can regenerate some neurons. Um, so sure, there's, it's not too late, but let's say maybe you cannot erase all the damage. And then the other thing about younger people, I just want to make a comment. Yeah, sure. You know, they used to call it juvenile diabetes. And then there was adult type two and, you know, then type mm -hmm. one. And now there's, they're blurring that. They don't call it juvenile diabetes because teenagers are getting it. And so many people, what you just said about prediabetes, I think it's between a quarter and a third of Americans have it. Most people, I think it's at least most or half, have no idea they have it. They haven't tested their blood sugar. Um, and then in some of, one of the studies I looked at for this National Geographic story where they looked at um, uh, I think it was 11,000 people, it was a Brazilian study, and they noticed that the people eating the most ultra-processed food that were under age 60 were showing the most rapid cognitive decline. Oh, so boy. sure, age is the biggest risk factor for cognitive decline, but look at, you know, I don't know why this could be, maybe the older people had Earlier in their life, they weren't eating so many ultra processed foods. So it's not that cumulative effect you're talking about, but this is affecting young people. I, you know, I, I, the world is on fire right now, right? The stress on all of us is so massive. 
and it seems insurmountable. And it, it, it's it, people of all ages are prone to binge eating, uh, comfort eating, and unfortunately are not heeding the warnings of, of the health professionals. This speaks to the addictive quality of the processed foods. I wanna get into that a little bit where um, there is a genuine addiction um, and a lot of people think it's just psychological. Well, I don't feel good about myself today or I'm afraid to go out or there's wars going on and I need, I need to eat to comfort myself. There is a bit of a lacking information on why people are doing that. What is the, the actual physical cravings for ultra processed food and how does that happen? Um, yeah, you, you said it well. I mean, I'm going to refer people to a woman named Ashley Gearhart who developed a food addiction. She was at Yale University, the Yale Food Addiction Scale. And I think it's, you can look it up online. You can take the little quiz because the Diagnostic and Statistical Manual you know, the big Bible for what is a mental disorder has not yet accepted food addiction. But I think we're getting there. More and more researchers are saying it's it's a real thing. And what this Ashley Gearhart said to me in this when I was interviewing her, she said, a cigarette, a, a ultra processed foods are closer to a cigarette than to a food that comes from mother nature. Wow. Because you know, our brains were designed when back when the Neanderthals and came to love sweets and fat because they're high in calories and we needed calories so desperately then. Um, you know, it was a little fruit, some nuts that had some fat in them. Fruit has a little bit of sugar. But her point was never in nature have we had a food that's high in sugar and high in fat at the same time. So like this... I was looking at, you know, Shake Shack shakes, and I think it was 27 teaspoons of sugar um, in, in one of those things. And um, so she said that the rush of sugar that comes into our gut, then it hits our brain. We've never seen anything like it. We, we have no defenses. Uh -huh. And so um, these foods are designed to be addictive and you know, lots of now studies saying that, you know, the big tobacco companies bought um, a lot of the soft drink companies back in the 60s, and they used a lot of the same tactics to addict people to these soft drinks and other, all these, you know, the other foods that are out there that they used for tobacco. So it's not just the salt, sugar, fat mix that's so addictive, the bright colors, the, yes. the packaging, you know, for kids, all of those action heroes and the, the, the toys. And so, um, that is, does that answer the addiction part? A hundred percent. I, you know, it's a combination, like you say, there's the, there's the physical, actual physical addiction and the continuing to crave that food because of the response, um, like drugs or smoking or, you know, what it may be. And also the allure. The brain. Yes. Yeah. And that allure of colors and being rewarded, uh, because people are rewarding themselves with food when they're actually thinking they're rewarding themselves with something that is prevalent in popular culture. So it's cool to eat it or cool to drink it. Um, and one of the things I found offensive is I'm in my sixties now. And I can remember when they were using supermodels to tout drinking soda, um, it, it, all kinds of junk food was being used having um, supermodels do the hamburger commercials and so forth. I don't wanna pick on any one product. I think it was just pervasive in our society that that was happening. and. Um, we haven't gotten over that. People have are still not able to see past the the marketing tactics and and the lore. And I always say that you know that's why I'm not rich because I tell everybody to drink water, eat vegetables, and go for a walk. <laughs> yeah. yeah, you know, it's, <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. And you know, I I was stunned, Janice, to see that this transcends all income and educational levels. Wh why do you think that is? I was I, you, okay, I'm going to ask you a little side. Are you stunned all the time when you meet people that went to an Ivy League medical school or, uh, you know, they're they're a professor or you go to a speaking engagement or a lecture and someone speaks and then they go over and then they eat all the donuts and the candy that's sitting there? I, I You know, the disconnect is unbelievable to me. 
Yeah, I to tell you, now the nutrition conferences I go to, the food's getting healthier. Yeah. But, um, Patricia, I don't know if, yeah, you, you mentioned that I am an adjunct at Georgetown University. Yes. And some of these students are come from, you know, very high income, socio, high socioeconomic status. And one of the assignments is they write everything down um, for two days. Okay. And you know, the chips and the fast food and lots of croissant. <laughs> um, <laughs> so yeah, there is a disconnect. Yeah. Sure. I mean, and um, so let, let's talk about this because we have both, you know, like, like I, I focus on this show about aging well, but so much of it is, you know, intergenerational, what goes on in families, how children and parents and grandparents dine together and how they're influenced. Uh, they influence each other from how the older people will influence the younger people and the younger people uh, influencing the older people. So I want to kind of circle back to that a little bit about people. All we talk about, and those of us in the wellness sector, you know, we want to shake people. Come on, you're 60, you're 50, you're 60, you're 70. So you really got to take care of yourself. And yet it's pervasive in those, the 50 plus age group, to want to be cool and be like the younger kids. And I think that plays a role in them wanting to eat more like them to, you know, just even Janice, remember going out for a cup of coffee was a cup of coffee. You know, now it's turned into a frothy 800 calorie um, something with, with foam and sugar and caramel sauce and Yes. chocolate and you know i never I, I wasn't allowed to a number two nobody spent eight dollars for a cup of coffee i think i took the girls out my daughter and her friends and the bill was 30 some odd dollars i'm like you girls just got a couple of coffees you know so here we are that that that's you know now it's that's i think part of why it's transcending all generations but um just to see that the disconnect like you say between a high socioeconomic level and what they're eating you know, when, when I, when I speak to older people about what they eat, the, there's, uh, and it's something that, you know, I like to partner with all my guests and say, we're partners in this, not to shame them, just to say, take a look, see what it is and see where you can make changes. People feel very attacked and offended when they're asked what it is they're eating or what it is they're doing or not doing. That's right. And, and, and just want to get back to the socioeconomics for a minute. Yeah it really shows how addictive these foods are that people who can afford, you know, the best vegetables and the farmer's market and the salmon and everything are still addicted to these ultra processed foods. And so people who can't afford some of these foods or they're in neighborhoods where there's not a whole foods, they're the corner store, the dollar store are just rife with these ultra processed foods. So you, you know, it, you, the shaming part is is a real problem. And you know, the the all the uh, experts I interviewed for this National Geographic story said the same thing: you've got to get rid of the blame, because if you think about it, you're in hostile territory. The the researchers call it the toxic food environment, and so you're in an environment designed to addict you. If you become addicted, that's normal. Your body is responding to the environment in a normal way. And we can talk about ways to try to get out of this trap um, if we have some time. That's my next question. Um, hey. what, can you share your top tips to combat the lure of the, fa the fast foods, the processed food, the convenience food? Because it's it, it, like you just mentioned, it's readily available 24-7 not just at supermarkets, convenience stores, you know, you go to fill your car up with gas and you go into pay and loaded with food. So what is our, how do we kick that habit? And I, yeah, okay, so I think just going back, really emphasizing this idea of not feeling ashamed because what happens when you feel ashamed of yourself, you go to those foods to soothe and comfort yourself. And those foods do work to soothe and comfort. So that's another thing, you know, but the problem is that they head up to your brain, cause inflammation, and the cycle continues. And the other issue is if they cause you to gain weight, um, once you gain too much weight 
and your fat cells start becoming dysfunctional, that's another source of inflammation. Um, all right, so now how do you get out of this? Okay, so this is going to be quite individual. Um, one thing, and this is a tactic that we dietitians use um, to help people with binge eating disorder or bulimia, and it can help everybody have a, a, a um, consistent eating pattern. Eat breakfast, lunch, dinner, two snacks or whatever you need, so that at least you're not setting yourself up for being really hungry and those chicken nuggets and the French fries are calling you majorly when you're really hungry. So, and then those with those meals, if there's an ultra processed food here and there, okay, but at least you're eating three, you know, meals. And then, you know, we humans are so adaptable. If you look around the world and you see these different cuisines and what people crave, you can change your taste buds, I promise. So you can try to um, eat less sweet sweets. For me, dark chocolate works. I, yeah. over the years, built up to the point where I'm in the 80% now. Mm -hmm. um, it takes a while, but that can work. Something like plain yogurt, add your maple syrup or honey at the beginning, at least, you know, to get that, that, that um, little rush that you need. Put some granola, not an, not an ultra processed food, by the way, plain yogurt, not ultra processed, um, a fruit yogurt you buy processed, I mean, sorry, ultra processed. The processed, so, right. Yeah. So um, maybe, you know, splurge on some ripe fruit. So find foods that you enjoy that are not these hyper sugary, hyper fat, hyper salty foods, and your taste buds will start to train down and anecdotally from, you know, I on and off have a private practice and my other fellow dietitians, they all say that once people wean themselves off and then they eat a Twinkie or, you know, these Shake Shack things, right? I know here I am, I'm naming names, but um, they find them almost revolting. Right, right. That's what, yeah, that's the, 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 the goal, right, is to try to find ways to, um, it's, it's a shift. It's not a substitute. It's not a giving up. Like you saying, it's a gradual movement towards, um, to just retraining yourself. I love, I love that you said that now. Um, I also just, you know, we're getting near time, but I wanted to, you know, also ask you for you, do you feel like, um, do you personally, say to yourself when you're going to eat something, I'm not going to eat that because it's bad for me? Or do you al allow a little bit of ultra process into your life? It, it, it's just such an interesting thing for someone who's so entrenched in this. You know, how do you feel for your own life? Well, fortunately, I live in a big city. I live in Washington, D.C. And my problem is I love sweets. <laughs> You know, and but there are bakeries and places here that will make things that are not ultra processed. They're still not healthy, but <laughs> they don't have chemicals and all of that. So what I do is I I set a goal. I mean, um, a limit for myself. You know, the word limit is sort of a bad word, but it's yeah. it's it's the reality. I will have you know two cookies or two pieces of cake or two baked things a week, every single day I have dark chocolate. And I had this client once, we issued her tickets like you would issue a person when you go to a, a fair and there's rides. And she, her problem was, was uh, margaritas. And so she had five margarita tickets and for the week. And once she used them up, even if it was Saturday night and she was at a party, she would not have that margarita. So I think having a plan, you have to, you are in a hostile territory. You have to have a plan of action. And I think setting some kind of boundaries for yourself can be kind of helpful. That's a very, very interesting analogy and a wonderful way to describe it. Lastly, Janice, what about water? Drink it. <laughs> You know, but do you have a, do you have a set? Is it, you know, where are we at with that? Cause you know, we keep, um, I just, I say the same thing, just have a glass of water sitting around all the time. So you can sip. Is there a six glass, eight glass, 10 glass a day recommendation? You know, where are we at with that in, in, in water? Well, 
option. There isn't. I mean, if you go get deep into the dietary guidelines and all that, there's a hydration uh, quota and no, you know, but you can meet a lot of that through fruits, vegetables, soup, herbal teas. Um, so if you're doing that type of thing, you probably maybe only need three glasses of water a day or four. Um, if it's really hot outside, you might need 12. Mm -hmm. So, you know, the color of your urine is kind of a guide. If it's light straw colored, you're probably hydrated, but that doesn't always work because there's certain foods that can make it a little dark. But um, I think I think that the eight glasses, even though there's not good science behind it, is a good idea. Good guideline. That's great. Yeah. Janice, this has been a wonderful conversation, so eye-opening and so informative. Um, and uh, you know, I want to know, what do you like about getting older? You know, you'd ask me that, and I'm so happy you asked because there's so many ways to complain about getting older. Yes. And I had a whole list of things. I think I'm going to tell you this one. I, I, I feel like I'm braver. And in some ways, maybe I'm a little insecure because I think, am I too old to do this? And But the braver part is because all of us in our life have succeeded at things and we've also failed, but you kind of go, oh yeah, I was able to do that. So for instance, about four years ago, I started teaching undergraduates. I'd never taught before. It is so nerve wracking to go in there. And, you know, I've, I've got pre-meds in my class and my, um, the, the head of my department said to me, just take the old lady and put her in a room, close the door and proceed. Yeah. And that is <laughs> so helpful to me. I have taken the old lady part of me. I'm 63 now. I'm thinking about aging. Um, and so I think that you know, you do feel a little more self-confident when you have some history behind you. And I have a lot more to say, but I don't want to take up your whole. No, I, I, I love hearing. And I want to tell you, I am. So 63 was historically you're on the way out, right? Used to be over 60. Uh, doing anything in, in, important was unheard of. Now we're embarking on new careers and new. And the fact that you you took up teaching is absolutely amazing. And it is scary. And I, you know, I think the kids look to you more as an authority than you realize, you know, that they, they have a lot of respect and they'll say, they may say she's old and she doesn't know what she's talking about, but they also say she's old and wiser and has wisdom. So, you know, there's a, there's a lot to be said for being the, you know, now you're the elder. And I don't mean that as a, a negative comment, uh, cultures respect their elders and look to their elders for for wisdom and guidance. So I think it's a wonderful thing. And in close, I hope you're right. Yeah. <laughs> Some days I think, yeah, yeah. they are yeah. paying attention. And they are, they are. It's really hard to know. Um, mm -hmm. I, I've taught for years and I've gone through all the, all the whole gamut with that. So, so, but in closing, I want to thank you so much, Janice Gibreen, um, uh, registered dietitian, wellness program developer, and adjunct professor at Georgetown University for joining us and sharing such valuable information to the listeners. I found Janice on National Geographic um, on the, I, I subscribe to both the magazine and to the online. So please look for her articles there. And this information is just amazing. And um, I wish you the best Janice moving forward. And thank you, Patricia. And those were terrific questions. It's obvious that you've really given this some thought. And thank you. Thank you know you. about a lot of this already yourself. Yeah. So. Thank you. And uh, thank you all for listening. Please subscribe to my YouTube channel, Patricia Greenberg, for our engaging discussions on all things aging well. And for feedback and topic requests, you can contact me at www.patriciagreenberg.com. Thank you again, Janice. And I look forward to meeting with you again. Okay. Have a good one. Thank you. You too. You too.